As early as 1951, Alco was in a tailspin. Its highly successful but ironically highly unreliable RS-3 was costing so much in terms of warranty repairs, it was hardly making the company any money. It was also continuing to tarnish the company's reputation in terms of its reliability of its engines. The more locomotives Alco made, in short, the more they lost in terms of reputation and cash. Not a good situation to be in, especially if you were challenging a massive company like General Motors at the time, who continued to crank out its GP7 and 9 locomotives, which were essentially mopping the floor with the Alco locomotives in terms of reliability and sheer sales. A good example of just how bad things were for Alco at this point would be the GP7 and GP9's combined sales of nearly 7,000. This was in sharp contrast to Alco's best-selling engine at that time, the RS3, which only managed to sell 1,418 units. Luckily, Alco had recognized the shortcomings of the 244 and made a rather elementary and common sense decision to simply not develop a new switcher based upon that power plant. Instead, the company would keep the rather outdated by this point S4, similar to this S2 we see operating here, and its old 539 six-cylinder prime mover in production. In addition to the aging S3, the company further would keep the Alco RS1 in production, providing an alternative to those who did not want to deal with a 244 prime mover, considering all the problems that the engines were having at that time. And so these now somewhat aging locomotives would have to continue to pull Alco along, if you will, to keep them supplied with cash as they continue to develop the 251 and as well as keep them relevant in the actual locomotive production market. In short, if the 244 had a welcome, it had long since worn it out. And it was now up to the 539, which was now outdated but still more reliable than its successor, to keep the company rolling down the tracks. Until the new 251 would finally make its debut. It is mainly because of this extended production run that Alco ordered the engine into that the RS-1 still to this day maintains the record for the longest production run of a domestic United States built diesel locomotive, a whopping 19 years. Even so, it only managed to sell in that time 469 units. RS3 would continue to stumble along until 1956. The reliability issues with this engine were dramatically reduced, especially after the H variant of the 244 was introduced. It's too bad that Alco did not have this newer variation of the prime mover in production when the RS3 was introduced, as it then could have lived up to all of its potential. Many companies that said that it acquired RS3 secondhand 
now drastically reduced in price and value due to their reliability issues and horrible mechanical reputations, found that these engines, once they were properly updated to the newer prime mover and or had the necessary repair work done on the existing prime movers and or other such modifications, ran very reliably and did their jobs very respectably. More importantly for these smaller companies, the fuel consumption was notably less than what the massive 16-cylinder, two-cycle combustion-style 567 prime movers offered at the time. For a small company, every little cent counted, and this was much appreciated. As for the increased maintenance, this wasn't a big deal for these smaller companies, as they could simply specialize their small maintenance staff in one specific locomotive. engines would prove very attractive to regional railroads in earlier years and in later years with a new breed of railroad called a short line. These smaller companies essentially would acquire rail lines that the bigger railroads, class 1 railroads as they're known, basically decide weren't necessary anymore and or were not profitable enough for them and turn them into profitable companies. These outfits required a very low operating budget and efficient engines that were cheap to acquire were just the ticket. The Batten Kill Railroad, as seen above, is one of those railroads. Formed in 1982, it operates two RS3s through some small rural communities of upstate New York. The company's primary and only interchange partner is Pan Am Railways, formerly known as Guilford Transportation. The interchange point is located in Eagle Bridge, New York. The company was also known for running a sightseeing train on weekends called the Rambler, which unfortunately got cancelled of several years back. This was definitely one of the few bright spots the RS3 had with its terrible reputation. Some of the regional railroads, so happy with the products they bought from Alco secondhand, would actually go back and actually purchase a brand new locomotive from Alco during the time Alco was still in business. The main reason being, it's less expensive to have the workforce specialize in one engine than several different ones. Another reason for this may be as simple as the fact that these companies enjoyed the qualities built into the Alco locomotives. The snorty growl when the throttle was increased, the rapid response, in sharp contrast to the 16-cylinder 567 prime movers, as well as the electronics that EMD was putting into its locomotives at the time which had to think about what they were going to do before they did it, essentially taking a little extra time to respond to throttle inputs by the engineer. Needless to say, Alco was not sitting still during this period in time. The company had to go back, look its wounds, and see where it went wrong with the 244. My only obvious and very comical conclusion that, and simplistic and rather and or elementary conclusion one can come to is that the 244 simply didn't work. More specifically, it failed miserably in quality control. Pretty much every possible aspect of this prime mover was a complete disaster, until the H variant came out, aka the 250 engine. Many refer to the 244 as a dud. I highly disagree with this. I think of the Alco 244 as a stink wad. I'm sure many of my viewers that went to school in the 90s like myself know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't, these were rather weird looking silver pouches that once stomped on would release a terrible odor, hopefully resulting in said kid getting sent to detention for a week. No matter what it seemed to do, it could not shake the aroma of that particular engine off. Whatever the case, if it was going to make an effort to get rid of the stench, it was going to have to start with something that actually worked the way it was supposed to. Therefore, the 251 was not going to be rushed into production. It was going to be aggressively tested in every way, shape, and form to ensure that any problems with the 244 would not be repeated in the 251. This simple and very logical decision unfortunately had its own consequences. Alco would start to hemorrhage more and more market share of the domestic diesel locomotive market, 
This is to say its competitors would continue to sell locomotives while Alco didn't, causing them to get more and more customers that Alco desperately needed to retain for itself. But essentially, the company had no choice in this matter as it simply could not afford another disaster as the 244 had been. <laughs> Alco quickly got down to taking a look at the 244 to see where its failings were, essentially debugging it so it could also debug the 251 and make sure that Prime Mover didn't suffer the same fate. According to its own internal repair records on the 244s, Alco found that the 12-cylinder variation of the Prime Mover was the most prone to failure. It could be surmised from this that this was caused by extensive switching work. Switching, or shunting as it's known in other countries, is the act of using a locomotive to put a train together from several different train cars. This is essentially stop-and-go traffic for a railroad locomotive as it, as it would be related to an automobile. Essentially, the engineer has to put the engine in a high throttle setting, as high as notch 8, which is the maximum, and then suddenly reduce the power. This puts an enormous amount of strain on the prime mover, specifically the crankshaft, which was something that Alco had had chronic failures with, with the 244. Alco had, of course, already by this point determined that the problems with the 244's crankshaft failure were a combination of issues with metallurgy, meaning the mixture of the actual metal being poured into the forms to be actually formed into the crankshaft, as well as defects in the bearing saddles that held the bearings in place. Whatever the case, Alco now extensively tested the 251 in switching applications before it was released, ensuring that the engine could withstand high revs for long periods of time, as well as being brought down to almost new RPMs. Alco would continue to diligently test the 251 until 1954, when it introduced its first product with the new 251 Prime Mover, roughly three years after development started, with the Alco S5, a new switcher that was designed to be the direct successor to the S series of switchers with the 539 Prime Mover. The locomotive itself would again have only six cylinders, however, it was a bit of a downgrade from its predecessor, only making 800 horsepower. Only seven of these units were sold. This may have been deliberate on Alco's part, as they were trying to gently phase the 251 into production, so if there were any problems, they could catch them before the whole thing turned into a massive fiasco as the 244 had been. Minor weaknesses were discovered with this particular model, but again minor ones, nothing catastrophic as the 244 had had, and Alco quickly would start to correct them on the fly with what few units were sold. The next locomotive that Alco would produce with the new 251 type prime mover would be the S6, introduced just short of a year after the S5. The S6 was very much an evolution of the S5, making 100 more horsepower using either the 251A as we used in the S5, or the new B variant of the 251 prime mover, which would make its debut in the latter production of this particular locomotive. It again was rated at 900 horsepower. Notable spotting features of the Alco S5 and S6 are the smokestack, which is moved forward along the hood to accommodate the new exhaust ports of the new Alco 251 engine. The trucks are another spotting feature. Unlike the old S1 and S3 switchers, which used the blunt trucks, and the S4, which utilized AAR-type trucks with journal bearings, the S6 and S5 utilized the then most recent variant of the AAR type truck equipped with roller bearings as seen in this model S6 we see switching cars. A total of 126 S6s would be produced from 1955 all the way through until December of 1960. In 1956, 
After roughly a year of trouble-free operations on the S6 type switcher, Alco finally decided the time was right for it to introduce its new road switcher, the first to utilize the company's new 251 series of prime movers. It should be noted that this was not the first new road switcher since the RS3. That honor belongs to the RSD7. This particular model was a limited production locomotive that was designed to match the horsepower of the most powerful locomotive in the industry at that time, the Fairbanks Morris Trainmaster. Unfortunately, it was not a big seller. A good reason for the locomotive's terrible sales may have been because it was equipped with the rather infamous 244 Prime Mover. This new road switcher would be known as the RS11. The locomotive would be equipped with the new variant of the 251B, cranking out a whopping 1800 horsepower, that's 50 more than EMD's current GP9 could manage. It did this, interestingly enough, with just 12 cylinders and turbocharging. While the car body design of this locomotive appears all new, it actually debuted a few years earlier on the RSD7, which was produced in 1954. Only 29 of these units were ever built, between then and 1956, all were scrapped. As we can see from the side shot, the locomotive pairs more than a passing resemblance to the GP9 at first glance. However, take a closer look and we see other details have been added. For example, on the front of the locomotive, which in this case is a high hood, we see that there are two notches underneath the number boards. This has become an Alco trademark for engines built from this period. There is also a recessed brake wheel between the two ladders reaching to the top where the sand filler hatches are. Along the side of the locomotive there are three vents which are used for the car body filters, as well as a rear radiator duct and a rear exhaust fan on the back of the locomotive itself. Like many previous Alcos, these vents on the side of the rear of the locomotive will open and close as needed to maintain the temperature inside the actual engine room. This was to ensure that the locomotive did not exceed the maximum or minimal temperature, assuring the locomotive wouldn't freeze or overheat while in operation. One unfortunate and very clear detail is unfortunately made very prevalent here, and that is that Alco was no longer leading but following the design trends. While this would of course help make the locomotive easier to sell, it would at the same time have the unfortunate side effect of causing the company to lose any of its unusual trademarks, although the notches and the brake wheel would stick out like sore thumbs to any true Alco enthusiast. We also note that the RS-11 has a much more raspy and or husky tone to its exhaust note, even more so than the RS-3 had. also a period where the general design of diesel locomotives was being challenged and indeed revolutionized. For example, most diesel locomotives would have always been long hood forward. In the case of the RS-11, they could be ordered with the short hood forward, that is to say where you see the short nose here, being the lead of the locomotive, or with the long hood forward. This particular locomotive in the shot, 1802 by the Genesee Valley Transportation Group, is in fact one of those long hood forward ordered locomotives. Many railroad companies, including the Norfolk and Western at the time, who ordered the lion's share of the domestically produced RS-11s, would have their Alco RS-11s set up for long hood forward operations. This was meant as a crew protection measure in case of an accident. While other railway companies would opt to have their locomotives set up for short hood forward operations to improve cab visibility for the crew. And indeed, there was even an option for a low nose, most railroads, however, would not choose this option. Few of these engines, in their later years, would be in fact modified to low nose status to give better visibility for the crew. While a lot of the big Class 1 railways turned down Alco's RS-11, there were several smaller railroads that had inherited and or purchased RS-3 second hand and found them to be very decent engines and would now go to Alco for more power. These companies couldn't afford to spend very much money and would often order just a handful of locomotives, two, maybe three at a time, but it was an important business for the company. Relatively small companies like the California Northern Railway and the Delaware and Hudson, who in particular was known for its Alco rosters, happily scooped up a few of these RS-11s and would later even acquire a few of them used when they went out of production as the DNH had that much of a good taste in their mouths from the Alcos and their performance. 
and Alco would get another lucky break here, not based upon how good its products were, but on how backed up its competitor was. GM was so apparently backlogged with locomotive orders, it apparently refused point blank to produce a steam generator equipped variation of its GP9 for the New Haven Railroad, which was looking for more commuter type locomotives that could also pull freight trains and basically be jack of all trades, much like the original RS1s and 3s. And so the company turned to Alco for an RS11 variation with the steam generator equipment installed, which as you can see by this Rapido model was produced for them, as well as several other custom options including, of all things, an air a Hancock air whistle type horn. One might think that this was a foolish idea for Alco to get into because after all, putting a steam generator into a locomotive can be very costly. Well, as it turns out, this wasn't for them, as Alco had planned since its actual demonstrator locomotives to include the option for a steam generator. You can see here by this Rapido model of an Alco demonstrator with the steam generator equipment installed. The unit num known as number 701B actually came with this from the factory to demonstrate to would-be railroads that the company actually had this option available if they were interested. First of all, because Alco already had the design for the steam generator equipment on the books, all it literally had to do was put the locomotive in production for the New Haven Railroad. This would ensure a rather quick delivery. Looking at the underside of this New Haven Railroad Rapido model, we can see how extensive the steam generator equipment is. The pipe you see neatly tucked underneath the frame actually carries the steam from the front steam generator all the way to the rear of the locomotive where it is then passed on to the coaches. Next, if we move on to the nose of the locomotive, we can see the steam generator air intake just in front of the cab itself. This next shot shows very clearly the steam generator exhaust located just ahead of it on the front of the nose. In pretty much every way, the RS-11 was everything the RS-3 wasn't. It was much more reliable, much more robust, and even more powerful. It also managed to do all of these things with much greater fuel efficiency than the EMD products did at the time. There was just one problem. Most of Alco's customers that had bought the RS-3 really weren't motivated to buy this engine. This was mainly due to the infamous reputation that the 244 had managed to create for itself. Railroads just simply assumed that this engine was junk without so much as giving it a chance. Or still, some of the railroads that would take the plunge and buy this locomotive because they were so desperate to get rid of steam engines and did not want to wait for GM's huge backlog to clear, would, f would immediately find fault with the engine over minor little details, dismissing the engine as junk. They were still that angry with Alco. This was a real tragedy, as this engine really was a wonderful piece of equipment. But, unfortunately, Alco's newly found terrible reputation would be something this locomotive would have to fight even before it even so much as got into production and into the hands of the first customers who ordered them. All that said, there were a few railroads that bought this locomotive and really were taken by it. These railroads include the, the Duluth, Winnipeg and Pacific Railroad with 15 of the units, the Erie Mining Company with another 15 units, the Ferrocarrios Nacionales de Mexico, the now defunct National Railway Operator of Mexico, who ordered a whopping 95 of these particular units, the New York Central Railroad, despite having serious issues with its RS3s, purchased 9 of these particular units, the New York, Chicago, and St. Louis Railroad with 35 of these units, and of course, seemingly at least at the time, Alco obsessed Delaware and Hudson Railroad, which would order 12 of these units, the Northern Pacific with 18 units, and finally, the Norfolk and Western, last but not least, with 99 units ordered. The largest first-hand buyer of the RS-11 from Alco.
total sales of the RS-11 wouldn't wind up being anything too shocking, especially compared with the company's previous road switcher model, the RS-3. The company only managed to successfully sell 431 of these units between the dates of 56 to 61. This number also includes the units that MLW, or Montreal Locomotive Works, Alco's Canadian subsidiary, cranked out mainly for export and also for the domestic Canadian market. In spite of its low sales, however, the Alco RS-11 was considered a success. Alco had successfully recovered at least some of its bad reputation from the RS-3. The new 251 was clearly a much more reliable power plant than its predecessor, the 244, had been. <laughs> Armed with the success the RS-11 and 251 Prime Movers had delivered, Alco appeared to feel emboldened that it was now ready to take GM on head first. The period following the RS-11's release would result in several lower volume locomotives being produced by the company, most of which were trouble prone, as the company could not seem to leave its bad habits and or old habits behind a.k.a. building small-volume, custom-built locomotives, much like they did with their steam engines, to compete with a mass manufacturer like GM. Also, failing to properly troubleshoot locomotives before they were released to their customers. We'll cover this unusual part of Alco's history in the next part of this documentary. And that's going to do it for this particular part of my Alco Road Switcher documentary. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Before I close out, again, I'd like to give my heartfelt thanks to all the YouTubers you see appearing on the screen now for allowing me to use their videos in this documentary. Again, my heartfelt thanks to all those who contributed videos. Thank you very much again. And as always, if you liked the video, please feel free to thumbs up it and subscribe. If you didn't, thumbs down. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, keep the metal side down.